This is a massive, massive inferno. It looks like it just ripped out. This is all ice covering the roadway. Walk with me here because you literally just slide. The hardest part is trying not to break a nail. It's ladies' night at Open Range in Crestwood, and these women are armed with the essentials. 357 Magnum revolver. 38 special Smith and Wesson. Too many to count. <laughs> Thursday's two for one special at the range means two women shoot for the price of one. Good job. CEO Barry Laws says over the past year, the number of women buying and shooting guns at open range has doubled. He says guns are a power equalizer for women. If you want to take the assumption that maybe you're not the biggest person in the world and I might be strategically stronger than you in certain areas with a firearm, we're equal. Sissy Kay and Janet Feister are preparing to apply for Kentucky's concealed carry license. Like most of the women here, their main reason for learning how to handle and shoot a gun is self-defense. I um, leave work late. I go in early and uh, I just like to have protection if I need it. If I ever need to have that option, I have it and I'm comfortable with using the gun and, and handling it. Just last month, police say a man with a knife approached a woman in a downtown Louisville parking garage demanding everything she had. The woman pulled out a gun and shot him. I thought it's really empowering um, for women and, and that she could do that and, and that she had the confidence to do that. You got to protect yourself. You have to protect yourself. Being vulnerable, being a woman, you know, you have to really protect yourself. And I felt like, you know, it was justified. We're seeing a lot more people, probably four times the amount of people that uh, we had before. Rick Falk at ESR Tactical in Jeffersonville says many of his new customers are women. Some even take part in a female-only shooting club called Freedom's Fierce Femmes. Pew Research shows women make up just about 25% of gun owners in the U.S., but experts say that number is growing. And women, they say, have better aim. Women, when they're shooting, it's you tell them what to do, they process the information, they do it, they get a bullseye, and then it's like, well, let's go eat something. As they came around the curve, saw a subject, uh, a white male sitting in the track cross-legged with his back to him. They locked up the brakes, but they still hit him, and then they weren't able to stop the engine until they got down to the intersection of uh, Frankfurt and uh, Bauer Avenue. When St. Matthew's police got the call around 5 this morning, the man who was sitting on the tracks was dead. He had been hit by the westbound train. Right now it's just going to be a death investigation uh, and we're not very far along in it. Police investigated the scene for hours Sunday morning. Right now it's uh, St. Matthew's, uh, Louisville Metro at the coroner's office and uh, CSX has one of their investigators on scene as well. At one point, crews separated the train, moving part farther down the tracks giving investigators more space to work. The train won't leave until it's released and probably won't be released until the body's removed and um, then the CSX personnel give them the go ahead to go. About three hours later, crews gave the go ahead and the train pulled off. But this isn't the first time a person has been hit by a train at this exact spot. Last May, police say a man walking near the train tracks was hit and killed. The man worked at the nearby car wash. Police say that accident happened in the middle of the afternoon. Sunday's crash remains under investigation. It was a shock, I think, at first. We knew it was something, but it's it was just hearing those words. In about 2.30 in the morning that night, I woke up kind of like screaming, oh my gosh, this is real. I had to wait over the weekend for my results, which was the longest weekend of my life. I was for sure that it wasn't cancer. I knew it wasn't. I was like, I'm 30. It's, it's not cancer. I remember sitting at the doctor's office and my mom sitting on, over there and them coming in and saying, you know, it is cancer. And we just looked at each other and they walked out and we just cried. I had a very rare type of breast cancer. It is less than 1% that's diagnosed every year. I was diagnosed on May 11th. 2015 with stage one uh, invasive ductal carcinoma. They did an ultrasound and it was a mass on both of my ovaries. I had the surgery actually the day after my 22nd birthday 
and at 22 years old, you know, you, you think, and the, the first thing that came to mind when they came in and said it is cancer was, I'm gonna lose my hair. My friend Lindsay, we shaved our heads together and, and that was okay, but once, once it went from um, being short to falling out, I felt like it took my pretty away. I was hospitalized twice um, during chemo. They actually were able to remove all of the cancer. I was officially cancer free on May 12, 2015 after I had my bilateral mastectomy. My last chemo was September 22nd of 2015. And when they come in and they just tell you, you know, you're cancer free, you don't have to have to worry. It's a, it's a relief. They had a big party. They come in ringing bells and throwing confetti. And it was like a relief. Like, you know, I get, I get to have my time back. To know that I'm gonna be okay, to be able to tell my husband and my kids, you know, we fought this, we have beat this, and we're gonna be okay. It's, it's just a wonderful, overwhelming feeling. Thinking about the people that can't be there, um, but also being surrounded by a group of survivors is just liberating. Uh, you know, you just, you feel blessed to be with this group, you know, that you made it, you survived. He was sitting up in that corner with his legs out. He had locked himself in the bathroom. Everything is exactly how we left it. His pants still folded neatly on the bed. But Benjamin Dominguez isn't coming home. It wasn't supposed to happen. Benjamin's life wasn't supposed to end like this. Unfortunately, heroin had the final say. His head was here and his body was lying down through here when they were doing CPR. He actually kind of had vomited and so they had to take some of the carpet. Benjamin died just a few days after Thanksgiving from a heroin overdose. My brother kicked the door in and that's when they found him. His body was still warm. A mother's pervasive pain is evident as she recalls the day. Wendy Palmer was working her normal shift at Jewish Hospital Shelbyville as an ER nurse when she heard the call come in. 1700 Charleston Way, unresponsive, unconscious patient, probable drug overdose. I was like, oh my God, that's my house, that's my son. Her son was just 19 years old. Benjamin, she says, was the kind of kid who had it all. A happy child with a wide smile that could light up a room. He played with his brother all the time. He, he was an absolute joy absolute joy. Benjamin was a solid student until he started smoking marijuana his sophomore year. Wendy says her sweet boy became a different person. Marijuana led to spice, followed by pills and finally heroin. By the age of 19, Benjamin had made two attempts at rehab and was clean for a good portion of time. But the pain of losing his best friend in a car crash drove him back to heroin. Wendy's list of what ifs is now a mile long. Only if I knew my community resource numbers and only if I didn't feel alone in, in my struggle with Benjamin and drugs. Wendy is now learning she wasn't alone in her desperate situation. In fact, the entire county is trying to step up. But I wanted to explain first a little bit about Shelby Prevention. You know, Kelly McNew is the director of Shelby Prevention. She's holding town hall meetings like this one to get the conversation going about heroin. Shelby County has been hit hard. The number of heroin overdose deaths doubled from 2014 to 2015. It's being seen across the state, but it's hit so heavy when it's just at home that, um, that it affects so many people, so many families. Healthcare workers, law enforcement members, addicts, and concerned citizens are all coming together to try and curb the deadly trend. Every day was different, every day was a roller coaster. It's a place Wendy Palmer never dreamed she'd find herself, speaking to a crowd about her own son's death, pleading for everyone to find a solution. Ben would want this. Ben would want me to share his story. If there's any hope that, that he could help someone else, 
not to, to, to use drugs in the first place or to understand what heroin can actually do to you.